So good evening, everybody, and welcome to Natekla Scotland's first monthly online forum for 2024. I'm really excited to welcome a colleague and a friend of Natekla Scotland, Mark Sheridan. He currently works at South Lanarkshire Council College. College. I, why do I always get that wrong, Mark? I should know that by now. Um, and is actually here to talk about something that I feel is very pertinent at the moment and is definitely a discussion that needs to be raised and talked widely across Scotland. And that is ESOL policy in Scotland. I think what will be interesting tonight is Mark's going to set the tone of where we have been, where we're at, and potentially where we need to go in the future or certainly what we need to think about for the future. So I'll hand over to Mark. Uh, Mark is going to give you some time at the end for questions, but please feel free to use the chat if you want to pop anything in there. And I would keep yourselves muted because that helps with everybody's sound quality. So huge thanks to Mark and over to you. Thank you, Pauline, and good evening, everyone. I'm going to probably be around 40 minutes, give or take, and I'm going to do a presentation in, in three parts, as it were. So as Pauline mentioned, I'm going to talk about the background, where, why are we where we're at at the moment? So that involves immigration, involves politics and, and lots of other stuff. And then in the middle section, going to present some research, um, which I carried out in 2022 into the Scottish government's 2015 to 2020 ESOL policy. Look at some specifics of that policy, which many of us will have lived through and try and give a practitioner's view of what happened, what actually went on then, and then some overall views on the strategy. And then in the future, think about what could happen in Scottish ESOL and specifically pose the question, is this the time for activism? Is this the time for us to, to do something to try and control our own narrative? So that's the plan. If there's any questions, if it's something um, that's a real burning issue, then please interrupt and ask. If not, I'm more than happy to talk through stuff at the end. So that's the scene, that's the plan for today. So part one is the development of the ESOL strategy in Scotland. And it kind of begins in, in 2007, when, remember, these bunch of young go-getters, when they formed the, the first government there, um, they brought forward Scotland's first bespoke ESOL strategy. It was in the works probably with the Labour government under Jack McConnell before, but the SNP brought it to fruition. And it made things different. It made everything different, actually. It, get, it gave the, the, the industry, it gave our profession some credibility. It gave us status. It gave us money, which can't be underestimated. And it in, increased the voice within government of, of the East Oxford community. Um, it set the bench for the UK and Ireland. Scotland led the way. Uh, Scottish East Oxford policy was held up as a model of best practice. Oh, hang on. I don't know. Uh, and we knew that Scotland knew that we were ahead of the game in terms of ESOL. We were continually told that and things were going really well. They weren't perfect, but they were certainly better than anywhere else. And they kept pace the Scottish government. They refreshed the strategy a couple of times at the last point being 2015. And it wasn't just ESOL. It was part of a whole policy suite, which is still extant at the moment. And it is designed to help new Scots settle and contribute to life in Scotland, the new Scots refugee integration strategy. So again, not perfect, but really good and significantly different from other parts of the UK. Um, and it's, I think, part of the SNP's brand, or it became part of the SNP brand, that they were significantly different from the UK Conservatives in terms of immigration and in terms of being welcoming. And they made... This policy, this set of immigration initiatives, including ESOL, overtly political. It was part of a wedge issue, part of the wider immigration debate. The SNP could say that they stood for something significantly different from London, and ESOL benefited, benefited from being part of that, with their own strategy, with their own voice, and with a really important place in the feminine of legislation that was there at that particular time. Um, I don't know if you remember these two guys, no idea what happened to the guy on the left. Um, when I first made this slide, he was in a shepherd's hut and was not relevant at all. And now he's Lord something of somewhere and he's the Foreign Secretary. Good God. Um, so going back 15 years, sorry, 20 years or so, the SNP had presented the case 
in the manifesto in 2007 for a Scottish green card. They wanted to take more control of immigration and make the country more welcoming. That is the absolute juxtaposition of the Conservatives' manifesto from round about the same time. And you can see some of the language, some of the, the buzzword dog whistle language that's included here. Immigration is too high, needs to be reduced. Net migration must go back, limiting access to... We've got the absolute polar opposites in this very important battleground. Um, and the SNP have continued this stance. So this is Alison Hewless speaking in Parliament. Um, and significantly, she, she references the new Scots refugee integration strategy. She talks about money that's going towards funding ESOL classes and then demanding the UK government reverse the ESOL cuts. So we're, we've got that that clear political stance here of the SNP throwing their arms around the ESOL community and the refugee integration schemes at odds with the rest of the population in, in London. Um, and to, to understand this further, or fully so that we, we need to look at the wider UK context because ESOL and migration are inextricably linked. Without migration, there isn't the need for ESOL. It seems obvious to say, but it's worth kind of reminding ourselves of that fact. And migration became the key political battleground from pre-2010, so pre-coalition government onwards. And we had guys like Nigel Farage, Nigel Farage, uh, becoming kingmakers in UK politics, becoming incredibly powerful and significant voices from a position really far to the right. In that 2010 campaign, um, the, the Tories used immigration and asylum as a, steep, a stick to beat the Labour government with. And the Labour government themselves were not particularly soft on immigration. It was the, the Brown government that introduced lots of the citizenship tests. But the arena kept shifting further and further to the right, people at Farage becoming more significant. And in Scotland, it presented a contradiction in policy terms. ESOL policy has devolved, but immigration is reserved to the UK. So there's always going to be this butting of heads, this kind of dichotomy where the two policies can't complement each other, they're always going to create a little bit of conflict. Um, and immigration moved centre stage. It became, from time to time, the biggest political issue of the entire decade, and um, particularly around about the, the 2016 Brexit referendum and the run-up to that. Um, Kim Ertz in 2015 said that the the British media served as uncritical loudspeakers for the Tory campaign. And this is significant because policy doesn't happen in a vacuum. Policy is made by politicians and politicians are shaped by public opinion. Print newspapers have are in a terminal decline. I used to work in that industry and have kind of witnessed this decline at first hand. But between the print versions of newspapers and their electronic versions, the Daily Mail or The Sun or The Times or The Telegraph can still control the news agenda or the news cycle for 24 hours and then it can begin again and again and again. So the press is really important in creating the atmosphere where policy is formed and that's significant because the press have been incredibly anti-immigration. We can see headline after headline page after front page it becomes hysterical the hysteria grows it becomes individual it doesn't represent much of the real world it represents a particular stance on it but it's just repeated again and again and again and again and it's not just the tabloids so the times and the telegraph the telegraph in particular would join this immigration feeding frenzy uh, i've actually this picture here of chosen on purpose because the, the headline on the left and the picture on the right actually contradict each other in, in the real world that we all live in because we're talking about a sharp rise in immigration and ministers have been warned about that there's an influx of workers it's an edge it's a, a odds to pledge uh, to the cuts that's been pledged and then we've got Richie Sunak taking a, a photo opportunity with Volodymyr Zelensky and in the last two and a half years the biggest proportion of immigrants coming to the UK have come from Ukraine so um doesn't actually seem to matter. They, they ignore the absolute um, insanity that, that, arounds, that is around the contradiction and they keep going and going and going. So the Scottish Government have tried to do things on this. Again, a couple more Telegraph headlines. Um, Sturgeon, Nicola Sturgeon, as First Minister, has tried to take more control over immigration for Scotland. 
but they failed. The the UK Supreme Court rela- ruled that the Scottish government couldn't take any more control over immigration. So we we go back to this dichotomy that ESOL policy is devolved, immigration policy is reserved, and never the twain have met. So just to summarise the, the first part of this, to give some of the background, um, we in Scotland have prioritised this on more than UK countries, and it was part of a wider suite of immigration, and we've done quite well with it. I think it is fair to say that credit where it's due, we have led and we have had practical successes in Scotland as a consequence of this. Strategies were improved, they were refreshed, and it kept them relevant. Not perfect, but relevant. And politically, we've had an SNP government for mm, coming up on 20 years now. Um, and they have embraced these all as part of a national immigration narrative. And um, they've leveraged it, they've used it to their own advantage, but that's an important part of their brand. And ESOL has benefited in terms of legitimacy and funding throughout the, the kind of period since 2007 onwards. So that sets the scene. Um, and amid all this madness in 2015, the new ESOL strategy was launched. So between the Scottish independence referendum and the Brexit referendum, we had the refresh of the strategy. And that was significant because it guaranteed voice, it guaranteed relevance, it guaranteed funding for the next five years. And the strategy wasn't perfect. We, we could pick holes in it. In fact, we're about to pick holes in it. But um, it wasn't perfect, but it was there. And it was that sense of of legitimising the profession and making sure it was part of the, the wider um, debate or the wider suite of things that could help people settle in Scotland. So I did some research in 2022 into the effectiveness of this strategy. This was the research question that I had set myself. I was working on a dissertation at the time. So I wanted to analyse the effectiveness of the, the strategy from 2015 to 2020 and then explore the possible learnings and challenges for the future. So there was two parts of it. And just as an overall summary, what the what the main sense that, that I got from the research that I did, um, it, it told me a couple of things. Firstly, the background is that the, the 2022, the Scottish Government subsumed its ESOL strategy into a new adult learning strategy. So they did away with the ESOL strategy as its own thing. ESOL became part of something else, not its own strategy, and that's quite significant. Um, so that created this research gap to analyse the success of it. I spoke to um, ESOL practitioners in Scotland, across CLD, further education, and the third sector, and actually higher education too. So I tried to get a cross-sector view. Um, I used questionnaires and I interviewed people. The interviewees held prominent positions, and I think significantly they were able to speak on behalf of bodies that they represented rather than just as an individual. And I got some qualitative and quantitative data for analysis. Um, the people I spoke to were predominantly teachers or lecturers, so people who actually teach ESOL. 12% were managers, 12% were volunteers, so quite a good cross-section there. In terms of where they worked, just under half worked in, in further education, 30% in CLD, 19% in charity, third sector, 4% in HE. And that's not far away from the overall uh, ESOL provision map in Scotland. So. As good a cross-section, I think, as I could have wanted when I started the research. And the general themes were that there was a recognition that the government were happy with themselves. They, they liked what they were doing. They thought they were doing a good job and they could kind of coast a little bit. There was a feeling of something I characterised as, as policy drift. So almost that the Scottish government was falling out of love a little bit with ESOL and the focus was moving somewhere else. It was moving further away from ESOL. Um, some noted 2007 as a high point. It peaked then and it's kind of deflated, it's retrenched ever since since that point. It's kind of gone backwards. Uh, a really strong perception about ESOL being sidelined. It's overall prominence reduced. We're not as important as we used to be. I'll touch on that in a, in a few minutes. There were concerns over funding. There's always concerns over funding. I think these have been exacerbated because the strategy that guaranteed the funding is no longer there. And there was a consistent reference to lack of voice. This is really significant. Um, and it comes back actually to one person who used to sit quite prominently within policy, policy formation not being there. So I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, 
the consultation process so it's a pretty big change and I think um, I used to work in industry and my old MD had a saying that in a, a process of change we tend to under communicate by a thousand percent and I've never worked in an organisation where that isn't true to some extent but only 56 of percent of people who worked in the industry and cared enough to answer the questionnaire were aware that the strategy was going to change now I guess this could be understandable. I, I used to work as a, a volunteer and then I worked as a part-time tutor in ESO. And I probably wouldn't have been aware of a policy change if that was my role because it wouldn't really have affected me working seven hours a week. It would have been out with my orbit of things to consider. But over half of people working in the industry not knowing that is waving a bit of a flag for me. I don't think it's something that the government should be particularly proud of. Um, when professionals were asked if their views had been considered, the results were, were pretty stark. So 72% said no, 28% weren't sure, nobody said yes. So not one person felt that the views of the people in the industry had been considered by the government making this change. I've flashed up some comments, some quotes from people who were there. I won't read through them, you can see them there. But I think it is significant that the people, the practitioners who deliver these all on a day-to-day -day basis felt that they weren't being heard. The idea was presented as a fait accompli. This is something we're going to do. It's going to be fantastic rather than, can you help us shape this? We're not sure if we've got it right. This theme of the ESOL voice kept coming back again and again and again. And it seemed to be able to be traced back to 2018. Um, there was a position within Education Scotland where the ESOL development officer was involved sign in, to a significant extent in ESOL administration and policy formation. And that person was removed. And it hugely diminished the influence that ESOL had in policy um, circles. So the, the person who replaced them was not an ESOL specialist. They didn't have the knowledge, the background, or perhaps the passion to input into the policy process and to shape it in a way that would be more suitable to the ESOL profession. And um, one view was that the government ignored the success of this role and gave the role to someone who would support the new policy direction rather than have someone there who may not, who may cause some issues about it. And importantly, the link between practitioner and policy was now gone. Policy doesn't happen in a vacuum. So that link, that voice, that knowledgeable expert presence within policy circles had gone. And the feeling was, the feeling came back that that severely impacted ESOL's ability to make its case and it wouldn't have helped the strategy to be renewed. Um, so that's the global stuff and it, it kind of feels a little bit bleak there. But moving on, the, the 2015 to 20 strategy had specific objectives, things that it said, we're going to do this. This is what's going to happen. Uh, within the space of my research, I didn't have time to analyse everything, so I chose four, and I, I chose four, sorry, and I've chosen these four here. So the first one, can every learner access ESOL provision? Could I, one that's been asked, can all your learners find a class? So 76% yes, said yes. That's a, a pretty um, a pretty good result. I think if I was the government, I would be really, really pleased with that. Only 12% said no. A further 12% said it was an area of concern. But I think that's a, a pretty strong tick in the box if you can have over 75%, over three quarters of people, <clears throat> excuse me, feeling that they, 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 they can find a class for most of the students. And um, there were significant areas where that didn't happen. Glasgow in particular had issues as an asylum dispersal city where there was just never enough places but nationwide, it seemed to be a tick in the box for the government. So, yeah. Um, asked about partnerships, which was a really important part of the 2015 strategy. And again, over half felt that there was an effective cooperation and only one fifth, only 20% felt that there wasn't. So again, marking their own homework, the government could say, yep, we've achieved this, two objectives out of two. That's a pretty good result. We're happy with that. Flexibility was another one. Can you move classes? Can you create classes to suit the need? Uh, and again, 52%, over half had said that they, they were flexible. 36% said they could be better. 12% said no. So it's not quite as clear cut um, a win, 
But I think if I was in the government, I would think 52%, okay, we, we've probably achieved that objective as part of the strategy. And the last thing that, that was asked about was the continued pref professional development. The CPD was a really important part of the 2015 strategy. Teachers and tutors and lecturers and volunteers being able to upskill themselves it's a fantastic uh, aspiration, and it looks like it's been achieved. So 65% said yes, they can access CPD. So another tick in the box for the government. So, so far, so good. Um, general responses are really positive on the specific good object, um, objectives, and that should be good news for the perceptions of the overall policy and good news for the Scottish government man management. Right? So that's good news. <laughs> but no, it wasn't. Outside of the specifics, when asked about more general feelings, the question, have the Scottish Government done a good job managing these halls in 2015? The feeling that came back in the questionnaires and the comments in the questionnaires and in the interviews was that it's kind of a bit shit. It wasn't as good as it could have been. So less than a, th a quarter of the people felt that a good job had been done managing these halls. So despite all the specific objectives, those boxes being ticked, there's a perception that things haven't gone as well as they, they could have been. 40% said, no, they haven't done a good job. 12% weren't sure. But that would be an area of concern that the overall perception isn't there. And some of the background information, what the practitioners said, I'm not going to read it verbatim. Again, the the, um, the quotations are on the, sc the scene, the screen, sorry. But to take the, the main thrust of this is that the government didn't people who worked in the sector did everything. Practitioners gave their own time, set up their own organisations, developed their own strategies without government oversight, without government intervention, without government support. I think there's a fine line between delegation and abdication. And the feeling that came back through the research was that this toppled over that line into abdication, as in you get on with it and we'll take the credit if it works rather than actually proactively managing anything. Um, next question was on funding. Have you had the necessary funding? Now, nobody's ever got enough money. There's always a case you could make for making more money for more staff and more classes, et cetera, more resources. But even in the time where the, the funding was guaranteed, over half of the people didn't feel there was enough money there. There wasn't enough support that went behind ESO as a, a discipline. And again, some of the comments that supported that, um, I'm not going to read them, but there was a, a the Syrian resettlement money was mentioned quite a few times. That came from Westminster, and it seemed to bolster lots of the Scottish government's ESOL provision. Um, and the last quote down at the bottom here came from an ESOL senior manager, and it's something I remember when the 2020 strategy expired, and ESOL money stopped being separate from the general college money. I remember the day it happened because my, my manager came and said, next year's courses, we're going to have to charge 128 quid for each course. And up until then, there was no charge for ESOL course because it was funded through the 2015 to 20 strategy. It changed right away. And this senior manager had said that they noticed that ESOL funding had stopped when the money became core funding. Couldn't answer the question as to why it had because they needed students they needed funding, they needed credits, but they couldn't run ESOL courses because the money wasn't seen to be there. So I think the funding part of that has been pretty significant. Um, asking about the future, is this the future bright? How do you feel about provision, uh, the future of ESOL provision? So only 4% are positive. 64% um, need more time and just under a third are negative thinking things are not going to be particular. Uh, particularly great. Um, so it's not a particularly happy vista, I don't think, at the moment, with 64% saying, mm, need more time. But most people, th are, sorry, 32% of people saying, actually, it's not great. Um, a feeling that ESOL could get lost. It's now six lines, or it's mentioned six times in the adult learning strategy. It's not its own document. It's not its own thing. Um, the policy document has been history. There's no strategy going forward. So I think it, it is a definitely a time of concern, a time of worry for anyone in the ESOL profession that we've lost our voice, we've lost some of our credibility, and we need to potentially do something to get that back. Um, 
we need to value, we need to see the value put back on our profession again. And that comes with government recognition and strategy. The adult learning strategy is a worthy aim. It's a worthy document, but it's not an ESOL strategy on its own. And I think that's where we need to aim, is to, to get back to our own strategy. So some conclusions. There is this definite dichotomy in the findings. Individual parts are really good, but overall the management was pretty rubbish. Um, the Scottish Government backed away from a successful and progressive policy. They did it really, really suddenly as well. They had a 2018 mid-strategy review, which gave no hint that the strategy wouldn't be renewed. In fact, it was positive and they spoke about aspects and that they would change in the future. And then all of a sudden it went without any real announcement of change. It kind of petered out rather than ending in any kind of cathartic um, statement. Um, the, the reservations that seem to be based on prestige and recognition of the pref profession, as well as the, the impact in teaching. Uh, as an ESOL professional, I guard my prof hands up, I guard my, my job, my profession really, really closely. I won't hear a word against it. And uh, there has been a perception of ESOL not being recognised as highly as some other subjects. I think that's changing in my own recognition. Um, but we need to guard against that, and um, certainly lots of respondents seem to feel that that was a real risk. Um, as always, geopolitical events have moved at a pace. There's a new substantial refugee community in Scotland, and Ukrainians who have come to, to join us here. Um, and some good news, a little kernel of good news here. In, um, I think, February last, last year, the government have allocated another half a million quid to two high priority areas, ESOL and employability. I've tried really hard to find out where this went and I can't and I haven't met anybody who can tell me. So if anybody knows anybody who can shed some light on this, then um, please get me them, put me in touch with them. Uh, I've asked around different managers, different teams in, in FE and in CLD and I haven't really seen anybody who's had any of the money yet, but it should be there. But it's good that the government have done this. It's good that they've recognised it. I think it's a lot of the Ukraine leverage that's, that's caused this policy change. So that's where we are now or where we were. So we, we sit with an ESOL part of an adult learning strategy and potentially at risk and under a little bit of threat. So my question, a time for activism and probably we need the help of everybody who's in on around the profession. So 2023 the UK has seen more activism, but in 2024 now, has seen more activism than any other time in, in decades. We've had more strikes and more strike action in the past couple of years than we have since the 1980s. So these are the days that have been lost to strike action up to the middle of, of 2023. Um, in comparison to the year before, it has gone up significantly. There is a sense, a sense that people have had enough, and that's a kind of hoary old cliche, but there is a sense that people are more inclined to action. Now, Northern Ireland closed um, recently because of strike action, the biggest strike action I think that's ever been seen there. And there is a sense that if people are unhappy, then they're going to do something about it. I'm a college lecturer. I, since I started, I've been on strike every single year in the past six or seven years. I don't think a year has passed where we haven't. Um, strike becomes wallpaper to our life, but I think it's becoming more and more prominent now. So activism is becoming more of a feature in the country. Is it a case for increased activism in ESOL? I would say that there is. Um, where do we go now with politics? So just as some background, the Scottish Government probably made its decision, probably because we don't know, to scrap the ESOL strategy around 2018-2019. At that point, Brexit was setting the political weather. So emigration was falling, emigration was rising. Um, between 2001 and 2017, the average net migration was 21,000 a year. So more people come, 21,000 people coming, more coming here than leaving. And in 2016, 17, immediately after the Brexit referendum, emigration fell by 80% from the EU and emigration rose by 80%. So two really, really high numbers, people going out, people coming in, changed massively. So Scotland's population was beginning to fall. 
and that would have been reflected by policymakers. They would have noted those figures. And my own feeling, I, I can't get, I couldn't prove this thesis, but as, as a working theory, I, I would say that it became easier to lose ESOL because EU, the most visible immigration, was going down, emigration was going up, and the need for ESOL would have been seen to be declining. Um, Brexit also set us on a path where immigration was going to be progressively more difficult. We had the Tory government's hostile environment, Theresa May's Home Secretary, making legal and illegal immigration more and more difficult. So the perception is likely to have been that ESOL will be less necessary than before, so it may be possible to merge it as part of another thing rather than become its own thing. That's a theory, not a fact. But things change. We, we've got Hong Kong, we've had Afghanistan, we've got Ukraine, we've still got Ukraine. We've got other, we've got the unfolding horrors of, of Gaza at the moment. Um, we've got Somalia, we've got Sudan, we've got Yemen. There are conflicts all over the world and people are going to move. We've got climate change, which is going to force people from um, from Africa northwards, from Hong Kong countries north, northwards. So immigration, legal or otherwise, is is going to be a thing. It's not going to go away, regardless of how much um, Westminster wants to, to wish it away. It's, it's still going to be a thing. It's gone up um, post-Brexit. It's higher than it was after Brexit than it was um, before Brexit. So that hasn't worked. It's just changed the patterns of immigration, which puts the need for ESOL back front and centre. It should be front and centre of government policy. Um, so can we change things? Can we actually do anything here? Can we make changes? We've got some positives. Um, we, we've got a professional body in the Tecla. We've got some really, really smart people. We've got some smart students. And I have yet to meet an ESOL lecturer who, or teacher or tutor or anything who, who didn't like a fight, who didn't want to write the wrongs of everything they see before them. And we tend to do that one student and one learner at a time to fix the little problems. If it's reading a letter, booking an appointment, I think we need to come together. We need leadership and hopefully Natekla can provide that to decide what we're going to do and then carry it out. There are some other things. So we've got some positives, but we've got some other things. We've got a really disparate workforce. We work across four sectors hundreds of organisations, there's loads of part-time workers, there's loads of temporary workers. So it's hard to get a coherence within the workforce. It's hard to contact all of our colleagues who do this job in different circumstances, in different environments. It's hard for us to come together. Um, and it's a circle that's going to be really difficult to square and we probably never will fully square it. But certainly if we can start to to find our way to communicate with these um, these disparate organisations, it brings us some unity. We've got this lack of voice in policy circles. It's still there. We're still not being heard loudly enough. Sometimes we're seen as nice, but not essential. So housing is essential. Doctors are essential. Social work is essential. Language should be essential, but it comes fourth or fifth in the list of things that are essential. I think it should be equally higher with some other things. It's also really easy to accept things as they are because it's really hard to change some of this stuff. So in our daily jobs, we we go from day from class to day to class to day to class, and it's hard to step back and take that helicopter view that would allow us, allow us to change things. So we accept things as we are and we, we move along. But can we can afford to do that? What can we do? So our status has been diminished. Our voice and policy has been silenced. This puts our students at risk. Can we defend them? First question. The adult learning strategy is now in place. Significantly, this contains a commitment to review progress so far. We need to leverage this and we need to work out how. They're going to do a halfway review and we have to be ready by the time that comes. Now, there was a well of anger around the process of change, but not a call to activism. I think we need one. It's a question. And what can we do? What battles can we win? Um, you probably recognise that I recognise this guy, Mick Lynch. He's a trade union leader. Uh, he did a podcast at the Edinburgh Festival with a journalist called Graham Spears, and I listened to the podcast. And this was it was asked a question actually by a college lecturer. I knew it was a college lecturer because she said I've been on strike nine times in ten years, and I thought, yep, I recognise that. I hear your voice. 
And he said, the key thing is you, you never go on strike unless you think you can win. You never choose a battle unless you think you can win it. So within our call to action, we have to be realistic. We have to look at the battles that, that we can win. And the first one probably is to look to regain our voice or a voice within government circles. And the tech club had meetings with, with ministers before with varying degrees of success. I think we need to start to do that again. We need to start a lobbying process. We need to have a group of people who are committed to act on behalf of our profession and get in the faces of government people and tell them that we are here, we have a voice, and this is what we need you to do. This is what our, youth, our learners, our students need you to do. So that's kind of my voice. Um, this is happening in some areas. So there are ESOL pressure groups and ESOL societies who are actively changing things day after day, week after week. I've just English for Action in, in London is a really good example. If you get the chance to look, they empower their students to do things. They empower their students to campaign on the issues that affect them, on housing, on poverty, on crime. The teachers lead the action, the students carry out the activism. Um, the, teacher, the teachers will help along the way. And I think it's a model that we have to follow. And I'm kind of going to just now put this over. If I can see there's some comments in chat. And I'd, I'd like to kind of open it up to comments. And what can we do? What would you like to do? What would your ideas be of how we can protect our profession and help our students? So I'm going to stop talking there. And if I kind of open it up. Um, Pauline, I'm not sure if you're... Yeah, on... I'm here. Um, would anybody like to speak to Mark and pose any questions, even your thoughts about what Mark has said? That would be great. I don't want it to be a conversation between myself and Mark, who come from a very similar <laughs> viewpoint. But if anyone would like to add anything in, then feel free to unmute yourself and share or maybe pop your comment in the chat box and we can discuss it as a, a group. Mark, I have a question. Um, uh -huh. So you mentioned that we should make ourselves heard um, mid-review of the adult learning strategy. When mm -hmm. is that due? It was launched in 2022. So that there isn't a specific date for it yet. It's likely to be some point 2024, 2025. And I think, okay. Gosha, one of the things that we need to do is actually find out the key milestones um, if we don't know what we're dealing with, we, we won't get anywhere. And the, the Scottish government are not the, the easiest to deal with sometimes. It can be hard to deal with the civil servants. You get a lot of chaff thrown in there. And it, I found it really difficult to get answers to direct questions. Um, but I think that has to be the, the starting point is we, we find out when that is and we prepare to have an active part in that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also think it has to, to begin before then. I think we have to begin to to use our influence, to use whatever kind of influence we have, to use the soft power that we have. Um, I think it's time we activated our students. We have hundreds and thousands of students across the country who would be as concerned as we are by the fact that ESOL is not at the top of the government's priority. But at the moment, they don't have a way to have their voice heard. And I have a slight concern because I think it can be easy to lead a student and we have a position of responsibility and authority as teachers and ESOL students tend to have a closer bond with the teacher than students of any other subject. There's been research that has, has kind of proved and illustrated that point. Mm -hmm. But I do think we have to make our students aware that we are under threat. Further education where I teach is under threat from the government. Um, Third sector funding has been going down year on year in, in recent times. Um, so I think how do we how do we galvanize our students? Is it letter writing campaign? There is not a politician in the world who doesn't want to be photographed with a class of ESOL students. They they love it. I've seen that firsthand so many times. Can we get our students to play their part in making our voice heard and raising? awareness of our profession. So gosh, I think you, you're dead on. We do need to be prepared for the, the ALS mid-strategy mid review. But before that, I think we need to start with our, our kind of direct influence and the soft power of our students' email campaigns. Um, I don't know about public protests. I'm not sure if that would that would work or not. 
but we, I think we have to do something and I kind of have more questions than answers. I've got some suggestions, but I, I'm, I'm more than open to, to anything that can be um, that can be suggested that may work. It's good to think about it, I think, because you're definitely right. Our students have really close bonds with us and whenever they have a question or a problem, we're very often the first person they approach. But I don't know how about you guys, but I found that they are less likely to complain as well. So yeah. trying to get some activism going on, trying to really get that debate going. Um, I think I've already seen it happening. Um, I've got a friend who works with Migrant Voice and I've seen a few things popping up when the policy changes were coming through or the Wanton Bill was coming through. So they were trying to get people together to actually speak about it and speak up about it. So there's definitely things we can do. Absolutely. Absolutely, Gosh, and I think that that's a really good point that we, we don't exist in a vacuum. And if we can include other organisations, the Refugee Council, Migrant Voice within whatever type of activity that, that we want to do, then so much the better. I think that type of um of collaboration and, and leverage would be really, really useful. So I think that's a that's a cracking idea. And if anybody has contacts within these other organizations, let's make contact and 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 see what we can do and explore the, the options and the possibilities we may have. Great. Thanks, Gosha. Katie, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks, Mark. That was great. Um, I know it would be. Um, I'm interested in a couple of the things that you said, specifically when you raised the issue of how like dispersed ESOL tends to be across all of the different sectors and stuff. And so I was thinking of how the fact that ESOL works in very differently regulated spaces um, the type of impact that's likely to have in terms of the challenges that it brings to activism. So you referenced um, EFA um, who work in the third sector. Um, and so they have a bit more space, a bit more freedom. Uh, they're not um, reliant or well, they're not, they don't have to adhere to the same practices and processes that say ESOL in the FE sector does. Um, so I wondered if you, if, if you had any thoughts about how activism works or how it might look differently across the different spaces in which ESOL works, because just then in your uh, reply to the previous question, you said you weren't sure if public protests would work. And I wondered whether maybe um, you think that there's a uh, perhaps a bit of a risk with certain types of activism um, when it's kind of directly linked to uh, FE sector, for example. But um, but thanks for that. It was it was really great, and I'm looking forward to talking to you more about it when I see you soon. Okay, that that's great. Um, I think that the, the issue with the the kind of the diverse working sectors, Katie, is, is more about coordination and trying to get people to do things together, to do things at one as one, sorry, and, and also to raise awareness. Um, and I would also, the, the comment that Gosha made, lots of our students are really, really happy that they have a class because they look around and see lots of people that don't and they, they don't particularly want to rock the boat. I get the feeling that the, the activism in London have managed to leave that behind them and think we're, we're not only going to rock the boat, we're going to turn the thing over if we don't actually get some recognition here. And maybe that's a step change that, that we need to take or we need to look at. Um, I would never rule out public protest. I'd love a good march. Um, so if, if there was an appetite to do that, then great. I, I see the activism that we have here as being essentially led by Natekla, because without leadership, it's not going to go anywhere. And it's going to be probably quite centralised to begin with, and then hopefully can can go out and start to include more people. Um, it could potentially be something like email campaigns that we do, or um, video messages going to specific politicians. We could have various politicians who are involved in this process. Um, and I think it, it, it's going to be tricky, but not impossible to reach all sectors. And I think that's what we, we have to try to do. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Um, does anybody else have anything they would like to add or comment on? Yeah, can I just make a comment about the adult learning strategy? Thanks very much. That was really interesting. Um, yeah. Now, I work for the WEA as well as uh, Edinburgh Council. And the I know when the, originally the strategy, the new strategy came out in 2022, it was called um, adult, it was called learning strategy for young people and families. 
So okay. uh, that was literally, and there was one sentence about ESOL in the whole strategy. So Ray Cowan of the WA um, lobbied long and hard to get the um, remit of the strategy changed to include um, ESOL learners, older people, single people, migrants, refugees, to widen the remit from just young people and families. But looking at the strategy, um, having read it through, and I've got the little bit about ESOL in front of me, it's just waffle. It's absolute waffly flimflam. There's, it, it just says nothing. And all the the only thing about ESOL is this review. When is it going to happen? I mean, we're already in 2024. That's two years on. There's no time frame. Uh, there's one short paragraph. I mean, if anybody's interested, you it, it, it's through on the point five towards the end of it on the um, strategic action plan. It, it, it gets towards the end of it. It's about three quarters of the way through the strategy is a strategic action plan. And it's point four. Undertake a review with learners and practitioners on the impact of Welcoming Our Learners Scotland's ESOL strategy 2015 to 2020. So all they're doing is the review. So establish an expert panel comprised of learners, practitioners and providers. How long is that going to take? What's it going to really achieve? And then incorporate the review recommendations into the adult learning strategy as this strategic action plan develops. It's very, very vague. It's non-committal. There's no time frame. There's nothing about funding. Um, it's uh, so depressing compared to the actual stra ESOL strategy 2015 to 2020 that laid out concrete plans and had a vision. There's absolutely no vision in this new strategy. And if the strategy is the policy that's leading what we all do, and is the, let's say, the kind of mission statement that we're all following in Scotland, mm -hmm. it's empty. There's nothing there. So, yes, I I do think activism is the way forward, but I'm a little bit um, uh, unoptimistic, pessimistic, in fact, about any um, concrete action that our politicians might take. I mean, I interviewed almost 200 asylum seekers and refugees in November and December in Glasgow for the WA, and there's literally no provision. It was heartbreaking. I had assessed them and there was almost nothing and everything. The only provision that there was, was under the umbrella of this multiply ESOL that the funding has to come through the new um mathematical strategy of Rishi Sunak that everybody's got to do math till the age of 18. So now all the WA ESOL courses in Glasgow, of which there are a few anyway for the 200 people, um, and that's only a small number of people on the ESOL, Glasgow ESOL register. That was only a small number. There were more and more and more that never even got an assessment and everything had to be, has to be done through the prism of multiply ESOL. So I'm actually teaching classes that are solely, I've got to shoehorn my teaching into this mathematical um, straitjacket. So these are two issues that I feel very strongly about is the wishy-washy language in the strategy and no time frame and no dynamic pushing of anything to get things moving. And the second thing is the um, imposition of the multiply ESOL on um, councils and third organisations like the W to get funding unless they I'm not saying all of the funding because obviously the Syrian funding is still going ahead and other funding I'm not really au fait Hannah for example who's here tonight would have more idea of the funding but certainly I have seen in the WA that the funding is coming through this um, ESOL multiply ESOL the sort of ESOL tagged onto maths sorry to speak at such length but it's something I think that is worth flagging up um, yeah, if I can just back uh, come in on that, Claire. Yeah, I think your your summation of the of the adult learning strategy is accurate and eloquent. Um, personally, I would just have went for bollocks, but you know, um, I think you said <laughs> much better than than I did. And that there isn't really any, um, there's there's no clear 
direction in there. There's no clear indication of what's going to happen. And whether that's a bad thing, it's, it's not necessarily all bad. It, it could be advantageous. It's something that we could work to. They don't really seem to know what they're doing. And they might, you know, could be doing a huge disservice here. But if they don't know what they're doing, it means they can be moulded. It means they can be influenced. And the, the politicians will bend with the wind. I think we've seen enough evidence that that would happen. But we've got We've got to make the wind blow, and it's brilliant that you're here from from an organisation that we could partner with, and we can present more of a united front, so that we have two or three or four or five organisations representatives, and we the first step usually is we we sit down with someone, we try and sit down with the responsible minister, we get an hour in the diary, and we begin to put our points across, and from that point on, we we don't let it go. We can then look at other ways that we can run the campaign. Um, I've seen some comments about how we, we teach our students and everything has to be neutral. That's absolutely fine. I think we can teach a neutral message and get our point across because lots of the stuff that we're talking about happening, um, if it's presented neutrally, it creates an argument for where we want our students to go anyway. Um, I've kind of... My, I've tried to be as neutral as I possibly can in, in putting this presentation together. So when I was pulling together front pages, it, it didn't take me long to find them. And that's presenting evidence. Now, it's obviously got a slant on it because it's telling the story I wanted to tell. But the evidence is there. And if we're going to present a neutral case, the neutral case will be in our favour. That There used to be a strategy that isn't anymore. Funding used to be in place. It isn't anymore. You would at one time have been almost guaranteed a class to go to by policy. The government would have guaranteed you could have found one. They don't anymore. So we can present facts, we can present them neutrally, and we can um, achieve the objective that we have, which is to get our students engaged and get them activated. Uh, hopefully, I hope. That's what, what I see. And I, I'm not even going to pretend to be neutral. I think we've got a fight, and I think we need to, to really take it on here. Thank you so much, Claire. That was actually really useful to hear, especially from WEA and the third sector. So I really appreciate that input. Uh, Arthur, you've got your hand up. I think you're still on mute, Arthur. Good evening. I'm on an unfamiliar computer. Can you hear me, Polly? <laughs> yes, yeah, we can. Right. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and Mark, huge appreciation for the presentation and the way you've presented it. And I just wanted to come in for a minute to say that things you've been indicating, talking about and flagging up are things I'm hearing um, where in Northern Ireland work is being done on an ESOL policy for the first time mm -hmm. and apparently something will be emerging within a month or so. Um, now I haven't seen the draft of it but one or two people have told me they're happier than they thought they would be with what was coming. The second thing is I'm aware and again Pauline you would know this but through the wider world of Natekla um, Greg Dugdale has been doing a fair amount um, on um, like policy ac um, activities um, and would have maybe insights into other areas. I don't know about Wales and I do know that the word policy brings anybody in Dublin out in a rash you know it's just a you know, they don't have one and they're not sure where they would even start. So well done, Mark. Very valuable. Thank you. So Thank just you. to give a bit of background there, Greg Dugdale is just the outgoing co-chair of Natekla UK. And he has done a lot of work um, in policy, but predominantly looking at England having an ESO policy. Um, but he is across policies and has engaged with the other uh, countries of the UK to try and understand where everybody sits. Um, I do believe that Wales published not a policy, but a reference to an ESOL strategy, Arthur. I do remember Mike Chick talking yes. about that late last year, but I'm, I'm unsure of the title off the top of my head. So it mm -hmm. has something, but maybe not a full policy document. Obviously, yeah. we have what's passing itself off as a, as a document. You're working on one in Northern Ireland. So mm -hmm. we're... It we're a bit of a mixed bag, I think, across the yeah. UK. And if I may say, so one of the issues that um, I'm increasingly aware of is the acronym soup and the vocabulary where people are not necessarily um, talking about different things. It's just they're using different words for it. Yeah, I think that's a very valid point. 
Does anybody have any last thoughts or comments they'd like to make or speak with Mark about? Uh, hi, can I just say something? Of uh, course. I'm um, I just joined the meeting. I'm not, I don't work with the adults. I'm in Glasgow in uh, Glasgow schools. Uh, so I just, you know, obviously a lot of your ESOL learners maybe start their journey in schools, particularly our senior phase moving into college. Mm -hmm. So it was really interesting, Mark, just to get that sort of overview of, of the adult learners. But uh, just in schools, you know, we like I was looking at some of our old ESOL policy and in 2009 we only um had seven schools presenting. We've got about 28 secondaries in Glasgow. And now, maybe apart from one school, one or two schools, all schools um, present. So it's really essential in Glasgow schools. And I was just thinking that journey uh, for our candidates, for our young people coming through. And I don't know if you sort of link with the schools. We are trying to link with the colleges. You know, there's a transition for some of our senior fears pupils, but... Um, obviously, um, we would be happy to sort of link with you as well, <laughs> uh, if that was uh, appropriate, you know. Uh, yes, of course it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the original 2007 strategy, we referenced ESOL in schools. And I know yes, from working yes. with a long time with Anne Morgan Thomas, who was one of the trailblazers okay. for the 2007 strategy. Strategy, she always firmly believed that ESOL for schools should be part of a wider ESOL strategy yeah. because it is all linked. The journey yeah. can start. I just think that journey, you know, and obviously for a lot of our young people, um, you know, who are who have English as an additional language and are in, or maybe not in the ESOL class, but there's still a lot of their parents, mm -hmm. you know, we know that they're on the waiting list and trying to access the register. So it's all sort of interlinked. Uh, it you know. absolutely is. And there's that muddy grind, the 16 to 18 year olds, which, yeah, uh -huh. you know, when I started teaching, you saw where school yeah. children, but now because we've lowered the age of entry into college, they're now young people at college. So we do have that age group there that really should be connected to yeah. us. So this is, again, this, I mean, I'm overtaking Mark's uh, viewpoint here, but that's why adult ESOL sitting in an adult learning strategy doesn't work because it's not speaking to everybody who needs yeah. to access ESOL across Scotland. Yeah, I think, well, if I can jump in on that, we yeah, create our own division. Within, see, within the ESOL profession, we create our own acronym soup, as Arthur said, because mm -hmm. we have a division between EAL and ESOL. Mm -hmm. So as, a, as, an Indo, as a, a group of practitioners, we tend to make that separation ourselves, and I completely agree that we shouldn't. And it should be one continuous chain. So whatever we can do to link that up, then mm -hmm. then yeah. I mean, we do. Obviously, we have our EL candidates, but our EL candidates in the uh, option time uh, would maybe would opt for ESO instead of English. Uh, so they would be doing, obviously, we do from national to, to higher, you know, so they were get, they'd be getting at the SQA ESO. Um, but they're obviously, they would all be under the umbrella of EL. Um, but doing any so sort of pathway course, yeah, over and above other additional, their own other curriculum subjects, yeah. But I just think it'd be quite good to link, you know, we are trying to link with the colleges more, ESO, you know, that transition. Yeah. Um, so... Some colleges yeah. have transition pathways where they actively yes, uh -huh. recruit, don't they? And they, they're moving people or young people from schools into colleges, but not everybody has the capabilities to do that, do they? Or have that necessarily that relationship with their local authority or area yeah. partnership working? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Rosalina. Well, thank really you. Great. It was really interesting. Thanks very much, Mark. Thank you. Any last comments before we finish for eight o'clock, everybody? I'm just going to add my email address into the chat box. If you are interested in continuing the conversation, you're very welcome to get in touch. Um, even if it is just a conversation and you have ideas, not everybody feels like activism is their thing, but um, you're very welcome to be in touch and I'll be delighted to hear from you. So as it's now eight o'clock, I'll pull this evening's session to a close. I say a huge thanks to Mark. He um, 
always inspires me when he talks and he has some great ideas. It's very difficult for me to keep quiet actually for a whole hour when you're talking. So thank you so much for posing the thoughts and the questions. I'm sure everyone has something to take away from that. And thank you to you all for joining us this evening. And we very much hope to see you at an Atecla Scotland event soon. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.